So we've got an idea of classical economics and how it functions. Classical economics is tricky, okay? Keynesian economics is going to be a little bit easier, all right? Keep in mind, classical economics is all about free market economics, laissez-faire, how the economy can fix itself. The government doesn't need to get involved, all of these things, okay? On the contrary, Keynesian economics is about government regulation. It's about how the government can get involved to help the economy in some circumstances, okay? So for Keynesian economics, everyone should have seen this term before, but it's based on a guy named John Maynard Keynes, who created a counter policy uh, proposal, basically, to classical economics. During the Great Depression, the economy wasn't fixing itself, so Keynes recommended that there is something else we could do, which is for the government to get involved to push or steer the economy. Hands-on economics. So this is the way the Keynesian graph looks. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but for Keynes, he believes it does look a little bit different. Aggregate supply looks like that, all right? Aggregate supply just represents production, okay? It's production. He believes it looks like this uh, for a, a reason I'm not gonna get into. If you're curious, let me know, I can explain it. Um, but he believes aggregate supply looks like that, but the bigger focus in his philosophy is on aggregate demand. Aggregate demand is the driver of the economy in Keynesian economics. We're going to explain why uh, shortly. But first, I just want you to see what this looks like in a graph and get the basic understanding of why Keynes believes what he does. Okay? So first of all, in this economy, there will be an equilibrium. Where those graphs cross, you get the real GDP. Okay? And for Keynes, there's also that maximum production level, okay? For Keynes, the maximum production level means that the unemployment rate is less than or even equal to 4.5%. Keynes doesn't so much worry about inflationary gaps. He doesn't worry about the economy overcooking because he believes the, the government can always step in to fix any problems, okay? So for Keynes, this unemployment rate being 4.5% or even lower tells us the economy is maxed out, all right? So in this circumstance, what we have is a recessionary gap, okay? We can use a lot of the same terminology we saw with classical economics. So we've got a recessionary gap. So for Keynes, we've got to figure out what we could do to fix this problem. Classical economics would say the government should do nothing, leave its hands off the economy. But Keynes is not so sure. Keynes is not sure that the economy is organized in such a predictable fashion. He doesn't believe necessarily that wages will adjust, that businesses will hire more labor, right? He doesn't necessarily believe these things are true. Basically, he views people as being very unpredictable. He says they exhibit animal spirits. They act kind of like animals. So if we, if we refer back to classical economics, right? Classical economics would say, in this circumstance with a recessionary gap, there's lots of unemployment. So businesses will reduce wages. Labor will realize they need to reduce their wages and wages will go down. Kane says maybe they just don't know what's happening. Maybe they don't care, right? Maybe they just freak out and ask for a higher, higher wage. He basically says we don't know what's going to happen. So he believes we need to get involved and steer the economy. This is mainly what we do in the U.S. nowadays, right? The government gets involved and the economy is struggling. So he recommends that we use expansionary fiscal policy. Expansionary fiscal policy just means that you do one of or perhaps both of these two things. You cut taxes or you increase government spending. And these two policies, despite being different, will have a very similar effect. The whole idea here is to get money into people's pocket to spend, okay? So if you cut taxes, that means people will take home more of the money that they're earning. Those people will spend that money and it will help stimulate the economy. The other option is to increase government spending. If the government hires someone, that person will now have more money and they will in turn spend a lot of that money, which will stimulate the economy. So in either case, this is about getting money into people's pockets so they can spend it. When done correctly, this will boost aggregate demand and stimulate the economy, okay? 
Of course, there's potential downsides, an obvious downside here being that it will create governmental debt when you do this. Okay. So that's the two basic ideas that we have in, in, in macroeconomics, the two mainstream belief systems. Okay. We're going to add monetary policy in the future. We'll talk more about that. That's obviously something very important to this course. But for now, let's just think about classical and Keynesian economics. And we can now tie this all back to financial markets. The validity of which of these is going to be most accurate will be based on how the loanable funds market operates. Hopefully everything's making sense so far with the classical versus Keynesian way of thinking. Uh, we will not always move this fast in this class, but you should have seen it this, right? You should have learned about classical economics. You should have learned about Keynesian economics in your principles courses. Maybe you didn't spend a whole lot of time with the graphs, okay? But you should have some foundation with which to work, okay? Same with this, Say's Law. Say's Law is something you should have at least discussed in passing in a principles course. Say's Law is the idea that supply creates demand. And it's a classical economic belief, all right? This is purely a classical way of thinking about the economy, all right? Say's Law is something that people struggle with a lot. They, they kind of misunderstanding, misunderstand it. Um, and that misunderstanding comes from uh, just seeing this expression, supply creates demand, that, that actually explains things in a very, very poor way. All right? well, what that sounds like is if you produce something, someone will buy it. That is not the case. All right? If you produce something that's, that nobody wants, they're not going to buy it. All right? Instead, it has to do with the mechanisms by which people earn money and spend it. Okay? So let's think about it this way. teaching a class and let's just say that I earn three, 300 bucks. Okay. First of all, why did I want to earn $300? What, what was the point? All right. And this is going to let you think about the brain of classical economists. The whole point for me of earning the $300 is to consume. That's the whole goal, right? If you take away the fact that we can spend the money, well, then it would lose its purpose, right? So we produce in order to consume. That consumption may take place quickly or it may take place in the future, right? But ultimately, the point of earning is to spend, all right? So that's the motivation, okay? Now think about what am I going to do with that $300, all right? Option one is I spend it all. If I spend all $300, this is going to work really well and very simply in a classical model. And we can think about this happening for the entire economy as well. If everyone quickly spent all the money that they earn, then supply would create demand. All right? That doesn't mean if you produce something, someone will buy it. But it means that my production, which got me that $300 in the first place, will lead to $300 in consumption. My production will create my consumption, okay? So production equals consumption. This means that when you think about the society, you don't have to worry about demand. You don't have to worry about consumption because production will create the consumption. As long as I earn the $300, the consumption will happen, all right? So the goal of any sort of body that's thinking about the economy is to just think about supply. That's why when we were drawing the classical graphs, we shifted that short run aggregate supply curve and not the demand curve because supply creates demand. So all you have to do is think about where that aggregate supply curve would be. However, there is of course a second option. A second option is that people could save their money. All right, I could save some of it or all of it. It's going to have the same effect, but let's just imagine I save it all, okay? Now, what happens to that money when you save it? It's a really important question, 
All right. In fact, that is a crucial question. It's one of those questions that I really hope you leave this class understanding is one of the most important questions in all of economics is what happens when you save your money. Okay. There's a few different possibilities. You could keep it at your house, right? You could take your $300 and you could keep it at your house. Or another very feasible possibility is you could put it into a checking account. For you, for the person that's saving the money, those feel pretty similar, right? If I keep $300 at my house or if I keep it at the bank, either way, I've got $300. But from a macroeconomic standpoint, from a financial standpoint, those are very different things, right? Because when you take your $300 and you put it in the bank, that allows the savings and investment market to work, the market for loanable funds to have some funding, okay? So here's what the classical economists believe would happen, all right? They believe that my $300 would be borrowed. It would enter a bank most likely and be loaned out, right? This is, let's face it, this is what would normally happen, roughly. If you have $300 you earn, probably it's going into a bank account. And the bank is going to loan out as much of that money as they can because that is how banks make profits, is through loans. So my $300 would be borrowed and still spent. So either way, regardless of whether I spend my money or save my money, my production would equal my consumption. All right? So for society as a whole, you see, as long as people are spending their money or saving it in a way that the financial market gets the money, supply will create demand. Production will create consumption. Okay? This is the crux by which classical economics is based. Now, what if this fails a bit? What if people stop trusting banks? That could be a catastrophe. Okay, think about the effects here. What if everybody who saved their money right now in the United States, what if everybody who saved their money suddenly got worried about banks? They believe banks are invalid. They believe that banks could fail. So they take all their money out of banks. All right. First of all, that would create a huge bank run. It'd be a big disaster. But just let's even think simpler than that. If everybody keeps their money at home, that would crush the economy, right? People borrow money to start businesses buy houses, go to college, and all of those things would be wiped out. Furthermore, Say's Law, this idea that supply would create demand, would obviously completely fall apart. If I earn $300 and then don't spend it, it doesn't really help society that much that I earned the $300 to begin with, because it would stop there. It wouldn't lead to any additional consumption. This is the dividing point between classical and Keynesian economics, because Keynes says, this is not going to happen all the time. In fact, that this law is not a law. It's just something somebody came up with that's a little bit wrong, all right? Sometimes it's a little bit wrong, but in some cases it could be way wrong. If people stop trusting banks, this whole thing is going to fall apart. So here is what Keynes believes. For Keynes, financial markets do not operate perfectly. All right, so we're talking about Keynes now, so I'm going to write his name up here so that we don't forget. For Keynes, financial markets may fail. Okay? Financial markets do not operate perfectly. And by the way, Keynes is right about this. Now, is he so right that we basically can ignore classical economics? Probably not, all right? And this is kind of the thing. Classical or Keynesian economics is not like one's right and one's wrong. It depends on our financial markets operating correctly, all right? That, that's the key factor. Our financial markets operating correctly, all right? So for Keynes, here's the thing. Some money we save is not spent. So think about how that would affect the economy. If I earn $300 and I spend it all, that's $300 in spending, good for the economy. But if I save my $300, maybe only $260 gets loaned out and spent. 
So for Keynes, if people save more of their money, that will hurt the economy in the short run, okay? If everybody starts saving more of their money, we're doomed to go into a recession because spending is more valuable to the economy than saving, okay? They're both useful, but every dollar spent is spent, whereas every dollar saved might only lead to 90 cents of spending, okay? So some money we save is not spent. So consumption, spending, demand is more valuable than saving. And that is why when we thought about Keynes and we drew his graph, we shifted the aggregate demand curve. That is why we need the government to get involved because things like people saving more money could happen any time. And we need the government to step in to fix these problems quickly. Okay. Now, who is right? As I said before, there's no perfect answer, but we can think about how banks actually operate, and we'll see that this does seem to lend itself a bit closer to Keynes, okay? So let's think about how banks actually operate, and let's go back to what we saw from the first video. Think about the market for loanable funds, and let's specifically think about the market for loanable funds for banks, okay? The stock market, we can think about the stock market as being a financial market. It does operate perfectly, right? You know, th there's no waste there. You, you buy some stock shares, somebody else gets all the money that you have. But if you think about the bank, if you put money in a bank, it doesn't all get borrowed and spent. It doesn't all go back directly into the economy. Instead, this is what it looks like. For banks, in the modern economy, basically anywhere in the world, where this is the quantity of loanable funds, right? This is one of our three key markets that we talked about, All right? This is the quantity of loanable funds. Do you remember what we put here? All right. So, you know, what is the price of money being saved and borrowed? That, that's the interest rate, I, right? So if we think about banks specifically, okay, where we have our savers and we have our borrowers, think about this market. Think about what equilibrium would mean. Equilibrium is what the classical economists believed to be the case, okay? Equilibrium, I could, I could draw some stuff to show it, but I, th I think you can visualize what an equilibrium would look like, right? An equilibrium would be here right at this crossing point. What that would mean is the quantity saved is equal to the quantity borrowed. That means if I put $300 in a bank, all of it gets loaned out and spent, right? That's, that's the classical economic view. But is that reasonable? If banks operated at equilibrium, how much money would be in a bank at any given moment? Zero. None. Right? Equilibrium means all dollars saved or borrowed. That means anytime a dollar goes into a bank, it gets loaned out. So banks have no money. Do banks have no money in the United States? Of course not. They always have money. In fact, in normal times, there's a rule that they have to hold a certain amount of money. It's called a required reserve rate. Banks have to hold, in normal times, 10% of their deposits, okay? So that means that this market is not going to operate at equilibrium, All right? So where is it going to operate then? If it's not at equilibrium, where would it be? All right, think about saving and borrowing. Is there going to be more saving or borrowing in banks, All right? Is there more money saved or borrowed? There must be more money saved, okay? There must be more money saved because if there's more money saved, that means there's going to be some money that is saved but not borrowed, right? This money in here that is saved but not borrowed, that is the deposits that are held at the bank, right? This is their reserves. That may be another way of thinking about this. That's their reserves, okay? So a bank might have $100 million in deposits, it might make $90 million in loans, and it's left with $10 million that are saved but not borrowed. It's left with $10 million in reserves. So if banks do operate this way, then you can basically put a check mark for Keynes for winning this argument. If banks operate in this fashion, all right, that means that if I spend my money, that will be more valuable for the economy. Every dollar I spend will be spent, right? But if I save a dollar, it's not all going to be spent. So if people start saving more money, that will cause economic uh, regression, right? That will cause the economy to shrink. 
So to kind of wrap all of this up and to connect all of this back to money and banking, there's a reason I like to start with this, okay? I'm giving you some, some feedback on some, on some things you should have seen from principles courses, but also this is a great motivating point in my eyes, okay? Here's the thing. The better the financial system works, the more valid classical economics is. To kind of conclude all this. When financial markets work well, classical economics is more valid. It's never going to be perfectly valid. I don't think there's such thing as perfect validity in macroeconomic models, right? That's kind of the frustrating thing about macroeconomics is there is no perfection. Hell, if there was perfection, we would just do that, right? If we knew all the answers, we could just perfect it and we'd never have to think about it anymore. But that's not the case. It's always going to be a moving target, okay? There's going to be things changing in the economy that changes the way we have to respond from a policy standpoint. In other words, it's not like a game of Monopoly where you have a rule book. It's like you have a different rule book every time you look at it, all right? The rules are constantly changing, okay? So when financial markets work well, classical economics is more valid. That means we need little government intervention. But the more out of whack the financial markets are, so when financial markets fail, which they often do in small doses, or they may do in a, cat a catastrophic way, right? I think we can always think about some failures, right? One little minute failure is I have money in my wallet right now, right? If I have money in my wallet, it's not doing anything. That's a, that's a little failure in a, in, a, in a way. A more catastrophic failure is like back in 2007 when the housing market collapsed and banks basically were going belly up. That's a catastrophe, right? The more that financial markets fail, the more the government has to get involved, you see. Because when markets fail, when financial markets fail, Keynesian economics becomes a more relevant way to think about the economy. So when financial markets fail, Keynesian economics makes more sense. And this is something that I, that I find very interesting and very compelling about this. I hope you're getting it as well. The thing to recognize is the entire view on how the economy operates is based on the financial markets. You see what I'm saying here? When financial markets work perfectly, the government can keep its hands off. The economy can function very well. When financial markets work poorly, the government's going to have to get involved. And to make things even more complicated, the government influences the validity of the financial markets. Okay? So the more the government screws up financial markets, if the government makes mistakes, the more the government screws up, the more the government is going to have to step back in and fix it. So as soon as things get a little out of whack, the government is going to have to get more and more involved. So you might end up in one of two areas. Either the government is involved very little and classical economics makes sense, or enough is going haywire that the government has to permanently be involved in the economy. So we almost end up in, in two very distinct camps with not a whole lot of gray area in between. So you might think about where we are in the United States, right? Are we in a circumstance where financial markets are operating poorly and the government's having to get involved a lot? Or are we more like in a free market standing? That changes over time, okay? So we're going to refer back to classical and Keynesian economics routinely in this course, okay? We're probably going to be drawing those graphs a few times. And certainly we're going to be dealing with that market for vulnerable funds a lot, okay? So these are very important ideas as we move forward.